Welcome and good afternoon. This is talk is about reinforcement learning. Uh, my name is Pratap. I'm a solutions architect at AWS. I work with AI and ML partners. And today we have Marcos Campos, head of AI at Banzai. First, let's see a video. The video is about an AI trying to play a game. It is a simple game where there is a car that's trying to go up a mountain and reach a flag. Boom. What did we see? This is a very simple game called Mountain Car. This game is provided by a company called OpenAI. It's a nonprofit company, research company, which creates these environments that simulates an environment, that simulates a scenario or a game. And the objective, uh, the, the agent drives the car. It's a two-dimensional space. The agent can push the car forward, accelerate, or take it backwards. It, al it always starts at the bottom of the valley. The catch of this game is that the car never has the power to accelerate directly, to go up the mountain ready to flag directly. It has to learn that the car has to back out, go back up, and when it comes down, it accelerates, uses this acceleration to go up the mountain. The important part of this is the agent, or the AI agent, was never told anything about this game. Right? It does not know what kind of state space it has, it does not know uh, where the hurdles are, it doesn't even know where the flag is. As you saw in the first part of the video, it explores the space by itself, learns about the environment, and finds the optimal path towards the goal. Well, we know we've heard about AI, right? And how does this kind of AI agent fit with the um, larger picture, right? We have seen, heard of many AI algorithms. So, so I'm going to talk, you know, we all know what AI is. I'm not going to be telling you what AI is. But it's, it's time to look at the landscape. <clears throat> AI uh, is usually a technology that can do what, uh, a hum it re what requires a human intelligence, right? The key word there is um, usually. That word injects uh, temporal obsolescence, that is, uh, things that it's somewhat similar to magic, right? Uh, magic is something that only magicians, Harry Potter can do, um, uh, since you're in Vegas, like David Copperfield can do, right? If, if people like uh, me started doing magic, I'm an ordinary person, right? It fails to be magic, nobody would call it magic, it becomes a trick. Similarly, AI algorithms, what used to be called AI algorithms, um, uh, decades back, like uh, a rules engine was the pinnacle of AI like several decades ago. It's not even considered AI today, right? And today what is considered AI is based on deep neural networks. And we're gonna see how we're gonna use this for our reinforcement learning. Even in this, there, there are different types of uh, AI uh, or machine learning. So you, pro you also probably heard about these stratifications, right? Supervised learning, unsupervised learning, but you've probably not gone deep, deep into the reinforcement learning, the third type, right? So just to touch on those first two topics, 
supervised learning is when you are training the AI agent uh, by showing, by giving it data, lots of data, and the data is labeled, labeled as in, um, we probably are familiar with the cats versus dogs identification program, right? Um, you give an image, you tell the agent, hey, this is a cat, dog, cat, dog, cat, dog, 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 cat, right? And you give millions of these images, and it starts to learn that it starts to recognize the animal in the picture. Unsupervised learning is when you get, give it millions of uh, pictures, but you don't really tell what the animal is or what is in this picture. You just show lots of pictures, and you, it, this helps us to do certain kinds of tasks. Reinforcement learning is where you don't give the agent any data. Just like how we started in the video, uh, the agent does not know anything about what is going to happen, so it starts fresh. What it does is it takes some action, and it explores the space, and finds out what is going on, what is, what is this world. And based on the exploration and the reward it gets for the, for the different actions, it finds a path towards the goal. This, you might have noticed that this is actually more intuitive to us, right? This is more similar to us. Reinforcement learning um, is inspired from animal behavior. In fact, I would say even human behavior. I sometimes feel like I'm doing reinforcement learning, right? Now, before we go into reinforcement learning and find out how the algorithm works, we need to have a framework. Right? How do you define the problem? In the, in the previous example of supervised learning cats versus dogs, it is defined as a classification problem. You give a data, that is a picture, and this, has to be, this data point has to be classified as one among the n classes, that is cats, dogs, and so on. Well, that is not so simple for reinforcement learning. So the way it works is it's called a Markov decision process. Um, I'm going to explain to you what it is before we go into more details, right? So we always start with a starting state, right? The car at the bottom of the valley, right? That is starting state. I'm marking this uh, with the green uh, circle here as zero. Now, we ultimately want to reach the terminal uh, state or the goal state. I'm marking that with S3 here, right? And the agent starts with S0 and it can take some actions. It has been given ability to take some actions. Um, I'm marking there are two actions that it can take in this diagram, um, A0 or A1, right? When it takes those actions, the environment changes in some way, like the car if moves forward, things change. So that is marked as other states. And when it, after it moves to the next state, it can take some more actions, and it discovers the different states there are, and the reward for moving to those states. So this is called a Markov decision process, right? Reinforcement learning, the objective of reinforcement learning is to go from the starting state to the uh, end state, that is the goal state, right? Let's look at a little bit more uh, uh, detailed picture. Again, there is a state space uh, assume that the left side, left green uh, circle represents the starting state. And the right side, it needs to go to the uh, right green circle. Now, it takes several actions. It goes to different states. Um, let's say it, it, uh, it, it, it after, uh, in the car, mountain car example, the program actually resets after 10 seconds, right? And again, comes back to S3, S0. And similarly, let's say the, the, um, the agent in this uh, state space is explored and identified these states. And after some ex exploration, it has identified that, hey, there is a path from my starting state, and I can take certain actions in each of these states and reach my goal, goal state, right? Now, that is the process of exploration. It takes uh, some actions at every uh, specific, uh, or it, it takes random actions to identify what is, what is, how, is how is the world. Right? Now, once I have found this, I can now continue to use this path as my best path. 
right? I have a story to tell. Can I tell a story? This is a true story. I, start, I joined AWS like a year and a half ago. And the, I, I, took, I take a train to work. So I take the car, I park it in the station, take the train to work. Um, and I was doing this for about six months. And one day I went to the station, there was, uh, I think there was a problem with the trains, so I could not take it. So, I, because I, I mean, what I'm doing is I found a path and I was exploiting that path because it's, it's, I don't have to think anymore, right? So it's almost uh, second nature. The problem was now I could not take that path. I was forced to explore. I thought I'll drive to work. Interestingly, I started driving and uh, four blocks from my home, I found a really nice coffee shop. I did not even notice that it existed, right? So I went into the coffee shop and uh, they had the best coffee. I never went to work, so I had worked from that coffee shop, right? So that is the example of exploration, right? Though, so you, there is always a trade-off between exploration and exploitation, and that is represented by a variable called epsilon in reinforcement learning. So initially, when you start the program, or AI, you will notice that the car was doing random things, so you want to, it to explore more. And as you go closer towards, uh, as you train more and more, know more about the state space, you want to reduce the exploration, start exploitation. All right, so that is one of the main concepts of reinforcement learning. Now let's look at one algorithm that actually works. This uh, algorithm was proposed in 1990, uh, this was proven to work in, um, to converge in finite time in 1992, so it's fairly old. Um, by the way, a reinforcement learning is older than even neural networks, right? So how does this work? Let's look at the software components architecture first. There is an agent. The agent is the one that takes action. That's where your AI lives, right? And you have environment, which is, could be a simulated environment, like this mountain car example, or if it's a, it could be a real world example where there's a robot that is exploring the room or the space. The agent takes an action on the environment and then the environment changes in some way. It could change, it may not change, it changes in a certain way. For the mountain car example, uh, it accelerates so the car moves, so that's a change in the state. And how does the agent know this? The agent knows by the environment sends back it by the observations it makes, right? Agents, the, the environment provides the observations and in addition, it provides a reward. Um, it could be a positive or a negative reward. Obviously the biggest reward, positive reward it gets is when it ultimately reaches the flag, right? If there may be a negative reward in the middle or there could be a, a, a huge negative reward in the middle. This, uh, designing a really good reward function is by field of itself. So this, this goes on. The agent keeps taking actions, learning about what happened. Takes an action, learning about what happened and the reward. And as it does this, very simply, it stores the data in a queue table. It's what is called a queue table. Very simple, it, it's a state action pair. And it, it, it shows, it stores the expected reward for a state action pair. Like let's say I'm in um, state A, I take action A0, I, get an, I, I should expect a certain reward. I, and then I, in another state, state two, I take action, so on, so on. And it's, it saves this in a table. This is, this is just a table, right? There's nothing fancy about this. And you use, the agent uses the data in this table to find a policy. A policy is where it could be a greedy policy or some kind of policy which says that when I'm in a certain state, I'm, always, I'm going to take a certain action because I expect a certain reward, right? So that is called a policy. What we want is the optimal policy, right? From this algorithms, we want the optimal policy. We don't want a very roundabout way to get things. We want the optimal policy to get to the final state. In addition, we also want to make sure we are able to find this policy in finite time. It's not like I'm just like wandering, exploring my space uh, for exploring. Uh, 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 it's, it's, there should be a goal, right? There should, should end in finite time, otherwise it's not going to be very useful. The problem with this queue table is that it's very large. 
right? Let's take the example of chess. Chess is not like it's not real world, just eight by eight, right? And there are 32 pieces. There are 10 to the 18 different states, combinations of uh, pieces on the board. And you need to, if you want to store all these states, you need to like have a really big table for just one game. And that is not even a real world scenario. Like let's take the example of Go, which has 19 by 19. It has uh, 10 to the power 172 states. Uh, there are, it's told that this is more than the number of atoms in the universe. So obviously this is not possible to store it. If there are finite states, um, in 1992 there was a proof that said that we could find the optimal path and it could converge. Right? Now, so now we have this problem of huge state table. In 2015, there was a paper that was published in Nature that solved this problem. Right? The problem it solved was it replaced the Q table with a neural network. So the neural network is what is called a nonlinear functional approximation of the Q table. Because it does not really store uh, one row for each state. It's an approximator. It, it provides only an approximation of the expected reward. But the magic here is that the, the neural network does not grow. It's a constant neural network. You update the weights, it learns, but it does not really grow in, in memory or in time. Now that is the brilliance of this. And why does this work? How, how, how did we bring such a large state space into this? The magic is that it is able to understand that certain states, even though they may look different, are probably the same. So it kind of aggregates. And it, the, the next trick is that it's only an approximation. It does not have the exact, it does not ever say that it's, it's gonna be the exact. So it's a nonlinear functional approximator of the Q table. Well, there was a problem with this initially. The problem was that when you are training a neural network, you want to give a lot of data, right? This is a deep neural network. Uh, this uh, involves um, a convoluted neural network, uh, a network in the first layer, and so on. There are many layers. So it was actually getting the, the screens shots of what is going on in the game that is getting input, and the, uh, the action that it takes, and then it predicts the, the expected reward. The problem was that you need to give this a lot of data. But the reinforcement learning always starts from S0 and takes a certain steps. Now this becomes a very sequential kind of data. Right? It starts from S0, S1, S2, and then S32, and then resets S0, S1, S2, S42. This makes the neural network um, what is called unstable. It includes, inserts uh, some kind of instability into the uh, neural network because of uh, some overfitting problems. So they create a new trick. One of the tricks they made to make this work was that they would store the uh, Q table values in something called a replay buffer. And in this replay buffer, it, this is a limited replay buffer. This is not infinite. Um, it depends on your use case. And use this replay buffer, sample this is randomly, and then use that to train your neural network. Then once you have trained the neural network, start using that neural network to, to, to define your uh, path. As simple as that. This system was able to uh, uh, beat or get up to human level of, uh, of uh, gameplay in those games. It could sometimes beat human beings as well. Right? Now, some more intuition into this. This is a beautiful picture that they printed in this paper. It is not a, a scan of the brain. It is not what it is. What it is is a two-dimensional representation of the last layer of the uh, hidden, last hidden layer of the neural network. What you see here are millions of dots, and it's in a very high-dimensional space. It's a high-dimensional vector but they have somehow transformed it to show in a two-dimensional space. It's called TSNE. And you can see that this is a game called Assault. If you guys played Assault, I played them. Uh, there is a person on the bottom that shoots 
there are aliens that are, that are there and you have to shoot and get some points. Right? If you notice the picture, there are a couple of things. There is also, uh, it's also color coded. It, the color code says that the blue means there's less reward and uh, red and dark red means that there's high reward for those states. If you notice, it is able to cluster the, the states in which, which are very similar. To the, look at the top right. right. There are three different states uh, that is represented by the picture. And they look kind of similar. And it is able to first map that into the same location. Right? It's, the distance between these two states are very similar. Now, that, is, that should be very intuitive. I'll tell you why. Right? Let's say you're playing a game, and I'm the game, I'm the actor, I'm shooting. Uh, there's an enemy here, I'm shooting here. And you notice that there is some clouds up there that is also part of the picture. Now, you know that the change in the clouds or the background does not affect the gameplay. It is not a different state. If you, the state only depends on me, on my, my location, and the enemy's location, or whatever, right? But we are only gave the picture of what is happening in the, uh, in the game. Uh, to the neural network. So it, it learned that the other things do not matter, so it can group these things together into one or in a smaller region. So that is the intuition behind that. And notice how it is able to provide, you can get an intuition as to why there's a higher uh, reward that you can get for those states, because the pictures on the right side has more aliens it can shoot, so it knows that there, it is going to get more and more rewards. Um, and the other ones is it does not have that many uh, aliens left to uh, hit, and so it does not. It knows that there is going to be less reward for those. All right. Now let's. That's all theory. Let's see how we can build this on AWS. Um, this is DQN architecture. Um, very simple architecture, right? Take I, I. What I've shown is a VPC, and inside that I have a, a P2 instance. I'm going to be using uh, the deep learning army, uh, Amazon deep learning army. It comes prepackaged with Python, Jupyter, um, and most of the deep learning engines like uh, Apache MXNet, TensorFlow, Cafe Tino, Torch, the whole bunch. Now, the, it also, uh, uh, it, I, what I've shown here is the blue boxes that we already saw, the AI agent. The AI agent is going to be the Python script that I'm going to be writing. The simulator is not, does not come with the, uh, the instance. Right? That is the OpenAI simulator. You can download that and install it. I'll give you instruction on how to do that. In addition, I have attached an Amazon EBS volume to make sure that I store uh, my files. This is, the de this is not the data file. <coughs> this is the, uh, the, the code, right? the other uh, metadata, the software. The, I, I would probably want access to S3, because once I've trained, I would probably want to store my um, uh, model in S3 so that I can shut this down, instance down. This is a P2 instance with GPU, so it's expensive. I, want to I would probably want to shut it down after the work is done. The last part is the DynamoDB table. The DynamoDB table I've added because if, if you think about the, uh, the uh, replay buffer, Right? The replay buffer it could be an in-memory uh, buffer, where uh, if you have it in memory, it's going to be limited by the amount of memory you have in this instance. Right? And that, if you want to increase that, and if you want to offload that from the instance, you can throw that into a DynamoDB table and, use, and learn sample from the DynamoDB table to learn your, to train your model. And you can use then you can use you access this using a browser once you have established a tunnel. Um, you probably heard that we announced the SageMaker service, so you could do this very similar thing with SageMaker as well. All right, so you can run this in, in under ten minutes. First thing, create a P2 instance using uh, Amazon Deep Learning Army. Install OpenAI Gym. It should take one minute or less. Copy the MXNet DQN notebook from uh, GitHub. And create an SSH tunnel and start your Jupyter notebook. Well, you can skip some of these steps 
if you're using SageMaker, because it creates your Jupyter instance. But this should take less than 10 minutes. So this is an instance that I ran using the exact steps that I showed you. And you can see that the, uh, on the bottom, I am displaying the uh, average reward per episode. Um, I ran for about uh, 2,500 episodes of this game called Assault. It's what you saw in the other picture. And the uh, average reward keeps going up. And this, was, this took about 30 minutes of training. Right? And so you do this. Let's say you do this, and your boss asks you, like, what, what is this? Why are you doing this? This is completely useless waste of time, right? It is not. Uh, it is, but it's awesome, right? <laughs> well, there are the, the reason we start with games is that it's a much smaller state space. And it gives you a visual cue as to what is going on. What is the gameplay? And you may even be able, able to find if it's able to identify newer kinds of gameplay that even you are not able to, you did not come up with. Right? This is something that you created, but it's able to do better than you. Right? That's almost a profound, scary thought. Right? There are some real life use cases for this. Right? Manufacturing, robotics. Um, uh, telling a robot to pick up a water bottle, that's, that's a difficult task. You can do that. A-B testing, multi-armed bandit uh, problem. This is used today. There was a paper uh, published by Amazon where uh, they use reinforcement learning for A-B testing. Um, the, uh, I'm sure you guys are familiar with A-B testing. You have a website. You want to have changes. You want to test it with the users. So you show a subset of your users, one version, another subset, another version. You want to see which one does better. Like, that is fine, but what if you have 20 such changes? You can't wait for each of these tests to go. And you also want to make sure that you, you make a combination of changes, right? You want to set a side table as well as changes, other things. How are you going to do that? So you could use reinforcement learning to combine these things. This is a very high state space. Right? And, it's a, and you want to understand how users are going to behave when there's a combination of things. They have used reinforcement learning, and it, is, uh, it has been uh, very effective in solving that. Logistics, there's a real-world use case. Finance, healthcare, customer support. You can, have, you can create realistic robots that can uh, talk um, almost realistically, again, and, and many more. Right. And let me now hand over to um, uh, uh, Marcos Campos. Bonsai is a, let me introduce Bonsai. They are a machine learning competency partner that was announced uh, two days ago. And uh, Marcos Campos. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Thanks, Pratap, for the wonderful introduction to reinforcement learning. Um, so we're going to take what Pratap showed, which is the introduction, and uh, showed games and highlight some potential use. And we're going to go a bit further and say, OK, how can we use that to solve more complex problems? Right? And in the process of doing that, we've been talking about bonsai uh, approach to do that. So you can see that in two ways. It's a way of codifying a number of techniques and um, best practices that are useful for people trying to do this, and putting that together in a platform. So we're going to talk about some of those. Uh, before we go there, just to, get me a, to give me a sense, how many, uh, show of hand, has read articles or papers about reinforcement learning? How many people here? Cool. And how many has actually tried or worked with reinforcement learning? It's better than last time. Last time, there was like the whole room had read. Two people had actually tried. <laughs> so that was more than close to 200 people. Um, so we're going to talk about, so those who have tried, you're gonna, one thing that you have, may have noticed, if we had tried to go beyond, let's say, a game or something that's back from open AI, is things can get complicated pretty quickly. Right? Reward functions themselves. Uh, you know, Bratap mentioned that. It's something that is quite hard to specify. So the space, when we look at the space of AI application, machine learning, 
right? There's a, a very wide spectrum. From the right-hand side, you have like data an analysis, data mining, customer, you know, can be applied to many different things, um, CRM and HR and you know, all kinds of things. And you can keep going, like going more like to perception, you want to go prediction, perception, and all the way to image recognition. To the left side, we go what we call industrial AI. That's a different class of problems, right? And that's where autom automation optimization plays a big role. And they have a bit of a different profile of those other activities. And you usually don't hear, nowadays we hear much more, but until a couple of years back, until deep reinforcement learning came around, you quite didn't hear as much about this. And the reason being that it has a very different way. You have to interact. It's an interactive process as you're trying to learn a controller. And also, the, when you look at many of those problems, the, the, is there is a delay re, uh, reward. You don't get the payoff immediately. So it's supervised learning. You do something, you know the answer. This one, you do something, nobody tells you the answer. Maybe you have to do many things until you find out. You play a game, you don't know if that move was necessarily good or bad until maybe many steps later. That's make the problem much more complicated. So we're going to be talking about industrial AI applications in the context of, of uh, enterprise and how we can try to make this more manageable. So bonsai bring together a number of things which are important if you try to do this. Right? One thing is abstraction. So when we talk about machine teaching is how can we move away from telling exactly what to do? what kind of architecture to use, what kind of um, algorithm to use, how to train that, to something more to the effect what you want to teach, not how you want to solve the problem. And we're going to see a some, couple of examples of that. So it's more like a declarative. You think about um, databases, right? They have a language like SQL, which basically tells you what you want. I want a set of rows. I don't tell, get me this set of rows by going to disk this way and that way using, you know, how you stripe data to the disk, all these low level details. is more just telling what you want, right? So having an abstraction, so the idea here is, is useful to have an abstraction layer between the user and the technology. The technology change very fast, by the way, right? The other thing is what we call concept networks. Another way of calling that's hierarchical reinforcement learning. Right? with many, many levels. Why? Because if you try to solve reinforcement learning problems with a single block, one algorithm, actually many problems are not solvable. The same algorithm, when you try to solve that, you give a reward to it, or you need to craft the problem so carefully with very complex reward functions to make to achieve. If you start decomposing the problem into pieces, and if those pieces now can be put together, you can reuse them, you find out that some of the problems that you could not solve are all of a sudden become very easy to solve. So that's what we call concept networks. Is the name, basically, we talk about hierarchical reinforcement learning, which is actually getting a lot of interest. We're gonna have a NIPS uh, workshop uh, coming next week about hierarchical reinforcement learning as well. Simulations, well, that's an interesting thing, right? If you go work with a ro robot and you have very expensive machine, you don't wanna be doing exploration, like we saw the little, you know, the car going back and forth, the robots are going like uh, back and forth and they break a you know, very expensive machine. So having simula um, a simulator that you can actually interact with the system very fast, hopefully, your simulator is fast, collect a lot of samples, all those methods are very sample intensive, meaning we need to collect lots of data because the bigger the space you're using, right, the action space or state space, the more data you need to explore and learn. There's lots of strategies to solve that. But operating with simulator is a very effective way to do this. And the other part that we use, of course, we talk about reinforcement learning, is combine those in the context of reinforcement learning and different types of algorithms, right? One, there is no one algorithm fits all. Right? There are actually different algorithms, different architectures actually necessary for different class of problems, which actually put a lot of um, demand on the user. A, I, I, we like to joke that reinforcement learning is changed every three months. There is a seminal paper in the last couple of years. So in the context of what we saw just a bit ago, right, um, there is this loop in reinforcement learning. So if we look here, we say the brain, that would be the, a server, the bonsai server, interacting with a simulator. As I mentioned, simulators are important. 
for many applications, especially industrial applications, because many of the things you try to control are very expensive. Right. So basically, you get state, you know, you reward information from your simulator, and you send back an action, and that loop basically defines the training, uh, let's say, protocol for this kind of applications. So let's talk a little bit about given understanding what is this, how to put together a platform to do that, right? So we have three areas here. We have like the build side, the teach side, and the use, right? So when you talk about building, basically you talk about tools, and we have like a CLI, or web interface. We talk about different type of training sources. So for instance, we can have simulators that I mentioned. You can also have generators. We basically define how to create data and generate artificial data with certain profile that can be used to emulate certain kind of activity. Um, and also you can work with data. That's just basically what you usually do in supervised learning and supervised learning. So the platform can take all three, three types of data, which is useful. Also, you want the ability to embed prior knowledge or even some of the work that you have. Right? Many groups you know, have already work that have TensorFlow models or other kind of models, or even could be a rule-based information that you would like to use. Not everything needs to be solved with reinforcement learning. Right? In fact, as we're gonna see, it's actually very good if you can mix and match. Right? Some things, even robotics. Robots know how to do some things really well. I can move my arm all the way here. I can just give a command. I don't need to learn that. But then, to grasp something which has a, you know, a shape which is not well-defined, that's something harder, right? So the other thing is, well, there are different kinds of use cases, robotic control, HVAC, high volume air conditioning, and machine tuning, a number of industrial applications. You need a way to connect to those. And basically, if you have a simulator, you need to be able to connect the simulator, or in some cases, you know, have somebody that hosts that for you, right? Or once you have the brain, a way to communicate with that, if you have that in the server. So those are requirements that you want to have as you architect something like this. In the middle, we have basically what we call the engine, the teaching part, the AI engine, right? So we have a language called Inkling that defines things like, like SQL, really what you want to teach, not how you want to do it. And you're going to see some examples of that. And we have some things called like brains, which are high-level models, which are not a single concept, a single element. So like say, the example that we saw, mountain card, you have an algorithm, here's a reward for learn. A more complex thing, you need to orchestrate many different pieces, and how the data flow between them, and how you make that actually solve a more complex problem. And you can connect, ideally, want like something that connects to many libraries, like TensorFlow, Teano, CNTK, MXNet. And finally, can actually have an array of algorithms that you can pull them as necessary. So Bonsai Platform has this type of characteristics can be deployed on-premise or cloud-hosted, you know, AWS. And we achieve application-specific you know, specificity by having the user-defined concepts which are related to the business. We can accelerate the training by choosing the right algorithms, tuning them, managing concepts for you. And we design collaborative tools that different type of people, like data scientists and engineers that software developers can collaborate. The models are explainable. That's a very important. And today we have a lot of conversation about explainable AI. AI are doing great stuff. Nobody knows what they're doing. In fact, we have AI talking to AI in their own language. And nobody now is trying to say, can you speak to us? Right? Force them to speak. So it's very important, especially doing many of these applications, to have a way of auditing or even debug. Right. You can just say, oh, I have a neural network, I have a b one billion parameters, great. Something went wrong, what? Right. So, or if you have multi-modules, which one actually is the one that's giving a problem? Um, you also want the library algorithms. Whatever you're doing, ideally, your abstraction layer can isolate you for the ever fasting, very fast paced number of algorithms. Right. Algorithms are coming out every day. Ideally, you have, it would be nice to be able to write once, and as things change, you can just rerun your program, and the new version of the new best algorithm is just picked it up for you. So now we're going to like to illustrate some of the things I'm talking about with some use cases. Right? The first one would be a HVAC, high volume air conditioning control for energy optimization. So if you try to do this, uh, using, and we're gonna build in complexity as we go. If you try to do this 
with reinforcement learning. Right? We would like to first define, first step, define, go and simulate the process. As I mentioned, it's useful to have a simulator. So in this example here, we have basically control thermoset for maximum energy efficiency. Right? So inputs could be things like weather, room occupancy, power utility rate cards, control actions, thermoset control commands. That's the output of the system. So we can build like a, a model like in Simulink, right, which take those kind of um, elements, and you can interact in the loop that I mentioned and basically drive that simulation and get back rewards and next stage. So for every step, the, let's say the AI will talk to that simulator and say, hey, here's the, tell me the state, I'll give an action. And then say, okay, that's my next state after that, and here's the reward. And you keep learning from this. So, as I mentioned, we have uh, a language called Inkling that is declarative. So if you look here at the top, we have a schema that describes what the thermostat states. As we mentioned, you know, Pratap mentioned their states, their actions, right? and those are the building blocks, right? And rewards the other one. So here, for the thermostat, we have, for instance, a set temperature, the room temperature, right, or the state. And for the action, we define another state, which is just the Keys are on. And we have a configuration, third schema that's like a simulator configuration. You would like to, as you run different experiments, be able to drive your simulator in different ways. Right. So basically then, the idea as you teach a machine, you just describe what you want it to learn. So you say concept thermostat is an estimator, meaning you learn something that's a continuous value, not a discrete. And you pre basically you're making prediction, what you're predicting, that schema, how's heat action follows input, so what do you take as an input? Well, are you gonna use the house heat state, right? And you're gonna produce an output. Right. So, simulator, the, the next one you describe the simulator state, uh, statement, right? You just describe, okay, a simulator has, is named house heat config is the parameter we wanna pass in, different, in this particular training session, and we have basically the action, we define the state, Schema and the state to define the schema, and that's it, right? You provide the schema, you provide the configuration for the simulator, and we can train now or teach, find the algorithm, tune the parameters, and provide all that information back to you to, to learn this specific goal. So here, to give an example, you're gonna see a couple, so the second step is teach the AI. So we have the specification, how we teach the AI. There are a couple, two things. The left side, you're gonna see how it learns. I mean, the, that's the overall learning process. In the right side, you're gonna see how it learns. And you're gonna see some interesting thing that's actually quite useful. When you're doing simulation, the, not uh, this kind of learning, independently of which tool you're using, not, you need to be able to see not only how the learning is evolving, let's say, metrics, you know, that you can compute, but also how is that the control activity is exercised on the system. It's very intuitive, uh, instructive. If you see, for instance, OpenAI gym, you saw the car doing that. If I only gave you like a, the reward function evolution, which is useful, say, oh, it's converged, but converging to what? When you look at the behavior, you, you get a lot of insight. So here, you're gonna see on the right-hand side that's running, and you're gonna pop up like a screen that's showing how it's controlling the, um, the air conditioning. So the dial is trying to keep it at 20, and so initially it's not doing a very good job. As time goes by, and it's training different level, you see the curve that's basically starting from the room, is not, the air conditioning is not activated, so there is a time to actually warm up the room. But then, as it learns, it evolves, it getting tighter and tighter and less variance on on the curve, so you're gonna see next, this next run is gonna become tighter. Let's move forward a bit. And that evolves, it is, becomes like that. So basically, this is a very simple problem in that sense. Basically, one, one algorithm can solve that with just a very simple specification, and, but it's a good way of describing a building block. So you can see after a couple of runs, it becomes very good at controlling the HVAC. Now, there was no, in fact, this actually was run against, uh, with a partner of us 
and there is actually run in an apartment, two apartments side by side, one with the current uh, controller they have for the HVAC system, the other one is the artificial intelligent one, right? And the artificial intelligent one was able to produce better quality of comfort to, for low energy cost. And the learning was basically, here's the simulator, connect the system, define the parameters, and let it interact with the simulator. So let's go next. So basically, if we're reviewing that, we have, we build, we teach, then we need to deploy. Deploy, when you're deploying reinforcement learning, there's a number of dimensions. Some people actually want to deploy to a system that will be embedded, right? That's becoming more and more common. Others just want to have a server, depending on the time frame that you need the action loop to work on. So if it's very fast, then probably you need to put the solution close to the system. If that's slow, you can actually put that in the, in the web, you know, on a remote server and interact with that. This kind of controller, you don't need to be, you know, the, it could be the microsecond of things like that. You can actually interact remotely. So the other thing is that you also observe that some people, do, some companies do not actually want the AI to control the system, right? Interesting enough. They want the AI as a decision support. But they still are not sure, I mean, okay, AI could be good, but I trust my operators. But not all my operators are that good, right? So I want the AI to be there as a, oh, no, as a safeguarding, giving suggestions. Maybe you should pay attention now. Something might be going on. But still there is a human that define uh, the action in the end. <coughs> so another use case I'm gonna go over is like uh, advanced robotic control. Has anybody worked with robotics? One, a couple of people. So you might find this. If you haven't worked with robotics, I said, I don't think Terminator's coming anytime soon. Now, in this case, the idea was, again, with a partner of us, is collaboration. So you have a machine that will, a human that's trying to raise, let's like, say, a table or some other object, and the machine has to learn how to follow the lead of the, uh, of the person so that it can actually co cooperate. So maybe the person is raising that fast, you have to go faster. If the, it's going slower, it has to go slower. If the person is like going, in a, in a twisting the table a bit, you need to try to help and compensate. So that's the task that the, the, robot, the robot has to learn. Right. Here you see, so the task you have uh, for inputs, table force, table <coughs> torque, initial height of the table as we're training. Because you train with many, that's the thing. When you train, you train with many different scenarios. Right? You train because you're gonna put in operation, it's not gonna be the same person. Different person have different strength. We're gonna move things with different velocity. Maybe that you now when you get to engage, the table starts at a different height, right? So you train with all those different, different um, uh, scenarios so that the machine or the AI get a lot of uh, variability and can generalize well. And that defines, as you have a simulator, how you control the configuration for your simulator, right? You have different starting positions, you have different like, you know, profile, how the simulator reacts, that's the environment. In this case, the person moving the table. Right. So the control actions is a joint actuator commands, and you have like inputs, table force, as I mentioned. Um, on the right side, you see a very common like, uh, simulator used for robotics, which is Gazebo. Right. So it has many different robotics platforms that you can simulate and interact with. Again, so now when we look at this scenario, uh, we have a state which is more complex than before. We have you now elbow, so the definition of elbow, shoulder, flexors, which basically give the angles of the different pieces, and also like payload, height, row, and pitch, as you, you now we have, we have sensors for those. And the command is basically in tandem, you want both, the, you know, both arms to move in tandem, both you now elbows to move in tandem. That is the command that the, uh, the output the AI is producing. So on the right-hand side, again, we have a configuration that allows you to control the simulator in different ways, which is very useful when you're doing simulation. And you define a couple of things you wanted to achieve, which you define as concepts. You wanted to keep things um, lifting tandem. So in that way, you're just training how to lift in tandem, right? And the table is always um, leveled. There is an easier problem, right? You don't need to compensate for tor no. Uh, torques. The other ones learn how to level, keep things leveled. So you can train them separately, 
right? They have different word functions. They're easier to learn because they're much more localized and easier to express problems. So that's a good strategy when you're doing hierarchical reinforcement learning is to actually define sub-skills that you can learn much more localized and much faster. And finally, you say, well, I want to learn how to follow human leads as an estimator. And the language here is a predicts command, which is the output they want to produce, by follow, stand, and lift, keep level. So basically, use the skills that you have learned before as inputs that you can choose from what to use next. Right? So basically, what the AI is going to be doing now, it knows how to do keep things in ten, now lift in ten, know how to keep level. Now when you try to solve the task, you're gonna select, what should I be doing now? Oh, I see that the thing is kind of twisting. I will apply my skill with keep level. Now if things feels level, I just move in ten, right? Things, you now I detect that the, the human is moving too fast, I will accelerate. The move is too slow, I will slow down. So that is what is learning. So first you learn different skills and then you can combine the skills. So I'll show an example of the robot actually learning to do this. Actually showing here. So first we're gonna look at the robot trying in simulation in the gazebo trying. So the, we're simulating the, you know, the other end of the table, somebody that's just trying to raise the table and the robot basically doesn't know what to do. Right? It's trying to, it's randomly trying to respond to it. It's just like the, not doing a good job following anybody. Right. Now, after it has learned, you can see that it actually can follow the, the invisible human very well. And, in different, and these are different scenarios, like the, tor uh, the opposing force is varying from three to five Newton. There is some, you know, we don't observe because keeping things very level, but actually there is torque in the way the human, invisible human is actually raising the table, but it's compensating for that continuously. So again, in advanced robotics, we do, we build, you know, we design a specification. And again, in the bonsai platform, that's basically is an inkling file, which describes what you try to teach. If you were doing that set in a different way, you would have still to define what you're trying to teach in the different lessons. I want to define these different kinds of concepts. And then you have to implement codes to do those. But that's a good strategy. You want to actually break down problems. If you try to solve things at one shot, you're not going to be solving anything that's very complex, right? Or very, um, you know, that has a, a bigger application. Next, you need to teach, and then you need, for those kind of things, you need not only access to simulators, but also, because it's sample intensive, you need to have you know, scalability and parallelism, right? You need to be operating with multiple simulators at the same time. You need to be, now, the compute has to be parallelized for actually solving larger problems. Some of these problems are kind of millions of samples. Right. And next, you basically deploy that, or as I said, deploy directly in the platform or as a decision support system. And this is actually the example of a Baxter. Now, the next, I'm going to be showing something interesting, which is a set of exper you know, experiencing how you learn how to do pick and place with a robotic arm. Right. And by breaking that down into concepts, combining both um, classical, or let's say, and neural network-based concepts or activities, and how to merge them, right? And how by merging them you actually achieve, in fact, you achieve very fast training times. Now, but before going there, one thing to, I would like to highlight is that the reward function in the case that you're gonna be seeing is actually very tricky. For instance, if you give the uh, small errors in your reward function, can give very interesting behavior. So we actually, when we train this arm, uh, which was based trying to raise a cube, the, the designer actually put a wrong sign on the reward function. So what is, which instead of like try to stay with the cube, the, robot, uh, the AI was saying stay away from the cube. So the first thing he learned if it was like the cube was on the ground, instead of approaching the cube, I would have just done do, th this, move away my arm. Well, the AI learned that by approaching the, swinging the arm back and then approaching the cube at high speed and hitting like a golf ball, it could really throw it very far out, all right? Nobody taught, taught it how to play golf, but they realized that actually doing this very counter, you know, intuitive movement is basically, this is good, my reward is getting high, but now I'm gonna actually decrease my reward because I'm approaching the cube and I'm telling it to stay away. But I know that if I hit it, I'm gonna send that thing really far. And they said, wow, we're like, that's cool. 
Then say the same thing, train another task with train. Well, if you have the cube in your hand, right, move it. You know, to, well, the sign was wrong. We say, if you have it in your hand, move away from it. So I would have dropped it and moved my arm. That would be simple, right? Well, it actually, well, it did that too. But it learned over time that it was better to hold it, bring it back, and swing it and release. So you're basically playing baseball. Right? And again, nobody thought any of those coordination of movements to achieve those goals. The, the goal is basically just stay, instead of saying stay together with the cube, became stay, get away from it. And learn strategies to actually get away, which are very effective because they actually move the cube very far away in the simulation space. So now I'm going to see a video that is the AI with the right sign is <laughs> not doing those things. Oh, sorry about that. To find the right spot here. Ah, here we go. So the task here will be using concept networks to grasp an object and stack on top of another one. And we're going to use, as I said, the solution networks. We're going to decompose the problem in multiple sub-concepts and use hierarchical reinforcement learning. Right? So each one of the sub-concepts that we're seeing here, and we have a number of them, right, they are different controllers. Some of them reach and move. They can be implemented with like robotics classical controllers. You know how to move. The other one in green, actually, we implement with neural networks. Because they're more complex, they take information from the state. So for instance, orient. This is during training. So what it's trying to do, you say, well, be a good thing to orient the hand first, the, you know, to grasp something. Instead of just say, try to figure out this whole thing. Move the arm, grasp the, you know, turn, and then grasp, raise, stack. Say, well, how about if we do differently? First, we just say, move. Use a class controller. You can get there easily. Just you need to learn when to use it. That's, there is a neural network at the top that solves the whole problem and figure out when to use classical controllers versus neural network controllers. The next thing is say, well, just let train orient. You don't need to find out, know anything else about the task. You just stay cl close to a staging area. You just need to learn how to orient your hand with respect to the target that you're trying to raise. So this is what you're trying to see. Now, after it trains, you're going to see that it can orient very quickly towards the target. Right? Now it's grasping similarly. You start with the, thing, you know, the cube, and you need to grasp and raise it to a certain height. Right? You already start from like a, an oriented position. Now we're going to see how it does once it's trained. Very fast. You now achieve that. Now, it's not very good at stacking initially. Right? It has the cube in its hand. What are we trying to say now? Learn how to stack. Can you actually do it well? After you train just that piece, right? you can see you can do that very well. Now we want to combine all of them. So we learn each one of those individually. We want to create a controller that knows when to select each one of the subcontrollers, including classical tasks, to do it. So that is it trying to do that. So basically now, this is the training of the metacontroller. You know? It's not applying. As you know, we know how to do. It has, the AI has learned how to do different skills very well but it doesn't know when to apply them. Now, this is after it learn how to orchestrate those skills. So that describes some of the things you can do. The take home that we like to take is this. Reinforcement learning is fantastic. As I said, even something that can learn to throw a, a cube without nobody telling how to play baseball is amazing, right? But it is not hard, it is not easy to do. In fact, it can make it very easy to, um, to make mistakes. It's very, it's very hard to do it as a single shot deal. So basically, I can take something out of the box and do it. So really, there's a lot, it's amazing what's happening in the field, the number of uh, strategies that is coming together, which hierarchical enforcement learning is one of the most promising ones because it allows you to decompose, right? divide and conquer. So having that is very useful. And so a platform like Bonsai helps you to do that with less effort but is a strategy that anybody trying to do should try to pursue, you know, pursue because you're gonna get much be more benefits. And if you need to, you know, uh, would like to get more information, 
the get start uh, page. Thank you.